Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bearded Mystic Podcast and I'm your host Rahul N. Singh. Thank you for taking out the time today to either watch or listen to this podcast episode. Today we will be continuing on with the series called Wisdom of the Mystics. But before I do begin, there's a few announcements I would like to make. Please do give your support to the Bearded Mystic Podcast by signing up to the podcast Patreon page for ad-free and bonus episodes and other benefits depending on the tier that you select. Details are in the show notes or video description below. Every Saturday at 11am Eastern Standard Time there is a free virtual meditation session along with discussion and Q&A. If you're interested you can find the details in the show notes and video description below. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the new series, Direct and Unfiltered with the Bearded Mystic. More information is in the show notes and video description below. Please do like, comment and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you're listening to this on your favourite podcast streaming app, please give this podcast a 5 star rating and review the podcast and do follow or subscribe to get future episodes. Last month we looked at the teachings of my guru, Satguru Baba Hadev Singh Ji Maharaj and we went through a few quotes and I expressed some of my experiences with him and today we'll be looking at the teachings of Nisargadatta Maharaj. So Nisargadatta Maharaj, as we know, he's very honest, very direct. He didn't mince his words and that is what makes him an interesting person to look into. He used to sell beedis, which were kind of like cigarettes, in the corners of Mumbai. And he came across these teachings by his guru. We'll go through a few quotes of his and then we'll do a bit of an explanation. The first quote, Liberation is to be free, to be free of concepts. It is the freedom from the idea that there was or is any bondage. It is freedom from our mind, intellect and concepts. The self is free of any expectations to exist. Hence it doesn't need any liberation. The knower of the centre of mind-intellect is not troubled by them. The mind-intellect only affects the body identity. First of all, what we can understand from here, and just in general, the whole purpose of spirituality is to be free from conceptual understanding. And that is what makes Nisargadatta Maharaj very appealing for a lot of people because he does break you away from certain concepts. In fact, he didn't compromise on any level. And that's what made him quite interesting. I understand now his appeal because... If you look at people like Sam Harris, who may be, you know, considered an atheist, but he finds the writings or, or the sayings of Nisargadatta Maharaj to be quite interesting. So this says a lot about what Nisargadatta Maharaj is and what he represents, that he's able to even break free from the mold of the spiritual master or spiritual guru concept that people can have the whole purpose of spirituality is to be free from conceptual understanding and the whole purpose of utilizing concepts is to help us understand more and eventually get to the level of insight that's required to understand brahmgyan or the knowledge of brahman now concepts are very necessary because they do help us to discern like between the real and the unreal But we have to understand that we have to transcend the concepts at some point. We can't keep holding on to them because we have to start abiding in formless awareness. If we're going to continue on holding on to concepts or we continue holding on to the gyan instead of actually abiding in it, we are basically not utilizing its full capacity. First of all, what we need to understand is, you know, we are consciousness. We are this formless awareness. There's no doubt about it. And therefore, we're not bound by the body and mind. Now, whatever allows the body and mind to function, we are not that. As Ashtavakraji says in the Ashtavakra Gita, that if we think we are bound, then we are bound. 
if we think we are free, then we are free. It is as simple as that. Now, you hear that saying, but if you're going to hold on to it, then there's no point. But if you listen to it, see where it's pointing to, go to that direction where it's making you be aware of the thought of being free, then you realize, well, if the thought that you are free is freeing you, then you just stay in that freedom. That's the whole point, is to stay in the freedom instead of making freedom into a concept of, oh, I experienced freedom yesterday, I need to go to it. No, it's about being in freedom all the time, being in liberation, in Jivan Mukti all the time. To be in formless awareness, we do not need concepts, we do not need ideas or belief systems. They are just tools to use, but they are not things to keep going back to or keep referring back to the reason why I say this is because that means we're discounting what we actually are going through for example if I'm in formless awareness if I keep going back to the knowledge then I am stepping away from being in formless awareness and going to the knowledge so I'm going to the past I'm going to a different time that's why we have to be free from concepts so We utilize concepts, but we have to rise above. The moment we have some expectations of a deity, of some god or some guru, then we cannot know the self because the self is beyond these mundane expectations that we have. For example, we may expect a deity to listen to our prayers. We may expect a god to accept and give its grace to us and therefore gives us liberation. Or it may be some guru that if we chat to them, our life would be better. Or we may go to a guru and we may be like just holding on to the physical form instead of actually looking at the teachings. When we do that, then we cannot know the self because we're doing everything we can to distract us from knowing the self. We have to understand that the self is beyond those mundane expectations we have. And also like sometimes with a guru, we expect that Oh yeah, when they give us something, maybe then we become realized. No, you have to put in the effort. The Guru will point you in the right direction. I don't think the Guru's intention is ever to steer you away. But you may steer yourself away because the lure of the world is much more appealing. Formless awareness does not create any karma at all and therefore is always free. This is something we have to truly grasp. Although we are doing the actions in terms of the body and mind, but in reality, we are actually just watching this happen, being performed through the body and mind. We are the awareness that is observing it, not necessarily the one doing the action. The other way to see it is, you can see that Brahman, Nirgun Brahman, is doing everything. Therefore, again, the body and mind cannot own the action. Therefore, Nirgun Brahman will have to deal with the consequences or the or the positive results. So, even in that, we transcend. Even in that, we are beyond our own actions. Once we rest in this formless awareness, once we start abiding in this formless awareness, then our mind intellect is free. Basically, the manas and the buddhi cannot place its boundaries on formless awareness. Now, the emotional part of us and the intellectual part of us, they are restricted to a certain point and we have to exhaust them to go beyond them. So don't think that, oh, the manas is bad, I'm going to ignore it. No, you have to utilize the manas to go beyond the manas. You have to utilize the intellect to go beyond the intellect. That's the thing that people don't understand. When we say the truth is beyond your intellect or beyond your understanding, don't relate it to the physical body or the mind. What it's saying is utilize it, utilize your intellect and then see what's beyond. Have you actually gone to the end of the intellect and seen where it takes you? The only thing the mind and intellect does is affect the body, but has no impact on formless awareness. So the mind and intellect 
has an effect on the body. As we know, this happens if you go into depression or if you're ecstatic about something, endorphins are released. You eat a nice chocolate bar, endorphins are released, which is why I really like Easter because there's lots of chocolate. But, you know, that's only for the body. But on formless awareness, the witness of all this, the witness of the person eating the chocolate bar, the awareness is not changed. That is something we have to understand, that only the mind intellect will affect the body identity, nothing else. We have to shift the mind to understanding it is formless awareness and not the body. And that's the challenge. The second quote, Now you have heard that you are Brahman, put it into practice. Normally you take yourself as a man or a woman, as long as you are alive. In the same way, now you remember that you are Brahman. Whereas your body identification leads you to your death, your staying as Brahman saves you. Then time dissolves in you and not you in time. Our self is the same as Guru Deva. That is the only place to surrender. Again, very direct, very easy to understand. It's not difficult to grasp what he's saying. But... If we are not utilizing our intellect, if we're not studying the scriptures, if we're not contemplating upon the message, if we're not doing, you know, the Shravana Manana Nididi Asana, then we're not really getting anywhere. We have to first listen to the message. We have to fully comprehend the message and then fully practice the message. This is something we have to do if we are truly wanting to be spiritual. So in this second quote, really, this is the ultimate teaching that we have to put into practice, that we are Brahman. We have to fully understand that we are Brahman. Simply hearing that you are Brahman will never be enough. If that was the case, it's being said in every corner in India and nobody feels that they are Brahman yet. Obviously, we know that's not enough. How many people we see on YouTube say, Aham Brahm asked me, and then the next minute you know their YouTube video or YouTube channel is gone. It happens. And a lot of us may say it prematurely, but that's why it's very important to have a teacher or a coach, a spiritual coach, who can help you and not get you to go erratic with your ego. They're able to bring you back to reality. So you will have to first know that you're Brahman and then integrate that you are Brahman and then abide in Brahman. So that's the process that has to be done. As we remember our features in terms of body and mind, we must now get so accustomed to feeling that we are this formless awareness. That's the challenge. A lot of us struggle on this point of how to abide and feel that we are formless awareness because we feel so much in the body and mind. And it's true. We will continue to feel like we're the body and mind even when we start associating that we are Brahman. Now what happens is, you understand the body and mind is Brahman, experiencing Brahman. That's it. That's as simple as it gets. But, you know, it's a challenge to get to that understanding. But that's why it's important to continue listening to these messages, continue to practice these messages, continue to meditate, and it all helps us get closer to that Jivan Mukti state that we want to go to. This is powerful in terms of understanding. If you think you are this changing phenomena of the body and mind, then you will die. You will think it's the end. Naturally, you're, you will not think it's the beginning. You know that my life is running out and there's this feeling of dread and anxiety. And it doesn't matter even if you believe in some heaven or reincarnation. You still want to live and therefore you know it's the end. Even if you think in reincarnation, oh, I'll have the next life. Even that's not satisfactory. If you believe there's a heaven, then you will be like, well, when there's heaven, I'll lose the loved ones that I see right now. And the compromise is you'll see the loved ones that left already. But there's no guarantee. It's all based on faith. It's all based on belief. So everything you have to do is now, not later, now. People live in such a way, regardless of what they believe happens after death. What the shameful thing is, is that people don't put much into life before death, 
and yet worry about what happens after death. The afterlife is more important than the current actual life. That's the shameful thing. That's the thing I wish people learnt to do. And I, and I'll be very precise here in my words that if you are hopeful about something that happens in the afterlife, then you're not content right now. Contentment comes from the present moment. It arises from here. If you think that, oh, you believe in heaven, you're going to be content. No, because internally you can never be 100% sure. Never. Or even in reincarnation. Who can say that you will have the next birth in a human form? If you believe in reincarnation. We have to understand that it's a lot more nuanced than we actually truly understand it to be. However, remaining as Brahman saves you in what sense? How does it save you? It saves you from the fear of death. Why would you fear dying now? You are this undying, unborn, everlasting, eternal, attributeless, formless awareness. Why would you have any fear? What is there to fear when this is the only thing? There's only fear if there is a separation when you are told there's just this oneness how can you feel fear impossible it's not possible to, to feel fear in oneness it's impossible Nisargadatta the Maharaj is absolutely right when he says let the body die you know let the mind dissolve away and let formless awareness remain in being that's all you need to do nothing more and it's interesting, you know, the statement that he makes is so powerful. He says that that time dissolves in you and not you in time. Yeah, time dissolves in you. Meaning time dissolves in formless awareness. And that you as formless awareness do not dissolve in time. Because you do not belong to time. You are timeless. That's another thing we can understand from here. And that's why it's important to transcend the ticking clock of the body and mind. That's why. So understand that this formless awareness is like our loving guru as well. We have that love for being in formless awareness. Whenever we are in awareness, whenever we are that observer we are continuously in peace, continuously in what they call Sejavasta, this composed state of stability, of equipoise. There's no, there's no fluctuation in this state. That's the state of being we want to get to. And we need to make this our guru. We need to see it as we are completely in love with it. That's how we need to see it. If we are to surrender then it's only to formless awareness, not to anyone, pious or not. It doesn't matter if they're great, it doesn't matter if they're bad. You only surrender to formless awareness because that's the only thing that really is. All you're doing is surrendering this idea of separation to the reality of oneness. That's all. Then the third quote if you criticize your guru with foul words, you will be the one who suffers. One who gives you a mantra saying, you and I are one, and frees you of all ignorance, how can you blame him? The guru has given the mantra not to a man or a woman, but to the consciousness that is listening. The individual soul is full, but it is suffering due to fear of death. Compassion arises in sages, when they see the unnecessary suffering of their devotees. So Nisargadatta Maharaj here is warning us, you know, trying to give that warning, that before you speak ill of a guru, first understand the teaching. See if you fully comprehend the message before you start condemning them, saying what they're saying isn't working, or practice what they actually tell you to do, like utilize the tools that they have. If you're not going to do that, then you're not going to go far. For example, once I was having a conversation with someone and they said they didn't understand the gyan, the knowledge, the wisdom of Brahman. And they said the guru didn't do anything for them. 
And I said, stop there for a second. So my guru gives these tools of seva, sumiran and satsang. So seva means selfless service. Sumiran means remembrance or mindful remembrance. And satsang means keeping the company of the sages. And I asked, did you do those three things as the guru prescribed? And the person said, no, I didn't. I was like, but then how do you expect the Brahmgyan to one be understood and then become a living reality? And that's something that people do not do. They will take the knowledge, but they won't look to practice it. We have to be really careful that before we speak ill of a guru and their teachings, See if we are abiding by it first. Test it out. I have done that. There are certain groups that I have followed. And I've taken, for example, I was critical of the Brahma Kumaris in the last episode in the thoughts of the Bhagavad Gita. I was critical of them. And that's because I found their philosophy not to be sound. So it's only after fully checking it out, then does one give their point of view but if you've not fully practiced it if you're not fully investigated into it it's not going to take you anywhere many people claim that the insights into Brahman or this Brahman is not correct but they will not do any of the practices that the Guru suggests like I mentioned multiple excuses are given like what about my job what about my family how can I feed my family then at the same time they are praying to some god what type of devotees are these not true ones but time wasters because they are constantly worried about worldly affairs and then expect that they should be given literally the highest in spirituality it's not so easy and it shouldn't be given so easily In my opinion, those people that end up doing such things are nothing but time wasters. They are not people who are genuinely wanting to move forward in spirituality. For them, it's a good, it makes you feel good. It's a good hit of dopamine. That's all. One cannot expect much from them. Like I said, I think it's important to be critical of philosophies. I think it's very important to investigate into them. But at the same time, fully understand something before you condemn it. For example, my guru has always been teaching about this oneness. And therefore, I cannot blame my guru if I live in duality. Yeah, if I am continuously living in duality, then that's not my guru's fault. That's my fault. And I have to own up to it. I have to take ownership. I can't turn around and say, well, you know, it's such and such reason. No, I have chosen not to surrender. I have chosen not to put the practice in. When I say surrender, what I mean by surrender is when you practice the teachings. That's surrender. Because what you're saying is, yes, the world is there and I will function as I need to for my worldly life. But... My focus has to be on spirituality. Wherever I can literally do tiag. Tiag means renunciation. Wherever I can renounce the world and go into Nirgun Brahman, I will do it. Whenever I can go into that oneness, I will do it. That is true surrender. That is true renunciation. So own up to the fact that you want to live in duality. There's nothing wrong with the Guru's teachings if you're not practicing it. And I say this to myself too. Now, the question may be, well, who receives this Brahman? Who receives this insight into Brahman? Is it the mind? Is it the jeev or the soul? Is it the body? Fools believe in all or one of those options. And as Nisargadatta Maharaj said, and as every guru will tell you too, they just reveal to you that there is only formless awareness and that's what you are. That's it. It's never spoken to the body, or to the mind, or to the jeev. These three have to catch up, 
and you do not have to walk back to them. So once you understand that you're a Brahman, you stay there. You don't have to go back and see or hold the hands of the body or the mind or the jeev or the soul or whatever you want to believe in, whatever concept. You just have to stick with being in consciousness, being in formless awareness. They have to catch up to you, let them catch up. You stay firm in being in formless awareness. That's all. The one you call your jeev or this atma, this individual soul or even mind is Brahman itself. But this jeev doesn't identify with Brahman but with the body and therefore creates suffering because it fears death. This soul feels that or this mind will feel that there's going to be annihilation one day. I'm going to go. I can see people around me are dying. I can see that my body's getting older. All these things are catching up to me. I'm now fearing death. I can feel the hand of death literally really close to me. The thing is, that's because you associate with the body. Now, once you understand your consciousness, is there an end to consciousness? Has there been any break in consciousness? And no, there never is. That's the beauty of the sages or the gurus. They speak with compassion. Their compassion speaks. And that's why their words take their place in the heart. And they fill the heart with joy. Their messages, their presence. And whether they use sweet words or they use words that sting and are painful. It is compassion to wake us up. And therefore, they see us identify with the body, and they're guiding us to wake up and say, you're not this body, you're not this mind, you are this supreme Brahman. Know that you're Brahman and abide in Brahman. So, we have to, at least for the last time, identify as the body when we see the guru when we receive this knowledge of brahman but after that we have to move on we have to start abiding in consciousness you have to start abiding in formless awareness the fourth quote live with the awareness that your consciousness which is capable of moving the entire existence is in your body remember that your actions like eating hearing etc are not really yours but of prana in the presence of your consciousness. To offer everything to Brahman means to be nirgun or attributeless. So this is the ultimate understanding that you have to be aware of your awareness and what that means, you know, what it entails. Your awareness is Satchitananda, it is the whole of existence, it is the shared being and it is being expressed through the body that you have. And what you understand is that this body is one with the whole of existence, so it's one. There's no duality here. All the activities of the senses are there because of prana, because of the vital airs. And that is an object or a reflection of that one formless awareness. Prana is the vitality that allows the senses to be active. Without the prana, the senses cannot be, they cannot function properly. Therefore, with every movement of the senses, Offer it to this Nirgun Brahman, and that way you become attributeless, like awareness itself. It's really simple. That's all we have to do is offer everything to Brahman, offer everything to this formless awareness, and that is what it means to be attributeless. For example, if you're good at writing, you offer that to Brahman. Brahman is the good writer. Somebody may say to you, you offer it to Brahman. Someone may say you're a good speaker. You offer it to Brahman. You are a good human being. You offer that to Brahman. Everything you offer to Brahman, that way you have no attribute. You you don't know that you have any of these attributes because you've given them to Brahman. And once you know you're Brahman, then, then there's nothing left to say. Quote 5. In this world there is vast knowledge of science and other subjects and there is continuous learning. One can also learn to do miracles. I did not study all that. Based on the Guru's command, I only studied the Self. For me, all other learning lost their meaning. In the absence of faith in the Guru, you would go on changing Gurus, visit Mahatmas and various places of pilgrimage, attending available lectures. 
having complete faith in the Guru will free you of the need to go anywhere. This is interesting because if we think about it today, there's a lot of Guru hopping or we see Gurus on YouTube and we think we need to follow them or they may be right because they have so many subscribers and all this stuff. Or we see someone based on the algorithm on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or wherever. But to be honest, we need to be a bit more mindful and we need to actually think a bit more. We must understand the importance of science or of any study that is done in life. There's a lot to learn about the material nature and one should not see that if you're spiritual, you have to condemn science. No, you should embrace it. You should go with it. There will never be conclusions to this scientific knowledge. That's, that's the way it is. There's a continuous learning process. Some people have learned to do magic. Some people have learned to do some yogic tricks. And some have even performed so-called miracles. Or some people have performed miracles. The yogis may claim to do these things. Even people like Satya Sai Baba, who's been found out to be a fraud. And has found to be a con man because... Everything he has done is a mere trick and it's not really something of a miracle or something godly. What Nisarga Datta Maharaj says that he doesn't have any magic tricks, he doesn't understand science, he doesn't know to do miracles, he doesn't know any of those things. So what did he study? What did he, what does he go to? If he doesn't do any of those things, what does he do? So his master told him to study the self. That's it. This Brahman, this formless awareness. And what's interesting is my guru has also told me the same thing. That you focus on awareness. That's it. Be in awareness of the formless as much as possible. That was the teaching given to me. And that's something that I've just ran with. It's the same thing that Nisargadatta Maharaj also had. His guru told him, just be in the self. That was it. He just followed it. And that became his bhakti, that became his devotion, that became his, that became his satsang, that became everything for him. And that's the way formless awareness should be once we get that pointing from the teacher, from the spiritual coach, from the spiritual friend. Automatically, the other learnings are nice things to know. They're interesting. But the passion will always be towards formless awareness because that is unmatched. There's nothing like being in formless awareness. There's nothing more greater than knowing more about formless awareness. Reading the scriptures and just being in the glory of formless awareness. There's nothing greater than that. So you will understand that that, there's nothing matched to that. Have faith in this teaching of formless awareness. Put your all into it. But if you don't, then you will be guru hopping or guru shopping. And there's a lot of that that does go around, like I said earlier. You will see all sorts of wonders as you window shop for a guru, but who is the real one? Who is the one that you should go to? Who is the one that will really take you to the truth? Who can... He doesn't tell you to... So a guru may have certain processes in place, certain practices in place, but what about that guru that can make you see this formless or perceive this formless or be in this formless instantaneously that is the true mark of a teacher in my opinion that they should be able to say okay there is a way for you to see this directly right now but utilize these practices that's still fine the main key is if someone can tell you that you can get to this truth directly Without wasting a single moment of time, that person is true. Who doesn't look at what you do in life, how much money you have, what caste you are, what colour you are, what nationality you are, what sexual orientation you are, what your pronouns are. They don't care. They acknowledge all of, all of you. They acknowledge everything about you. And they go forward. And that's the difference. So that's the one thing you need to see. Now, you can go to these seminars, you can go to these lectures, these workshops that people do now, and these courses now that people do online, but you will not improve anything. 
You will go to all these places of pilgrimage, but forget the primary subject of awareness, the study of your true self. How can I know my true self? How can I be constantly in the awareness of my true self? And that only a guru can do for you. So therefore, truly have full faith in what the guru says about formless awareness alone. That is the one and that is the only and ultimate teaching. That you are formless awareness. That is the ultimate teaching. So follow yourself as you dissolve into formless awareness. Make it your everything and you will not need to search at some man-made place of worship or anything else that some of these so-called gurus tell you to do. You will be able to achieve the true perception, the true wisdom of formless awareness right now. That's the guarantee that gurus give. The true ones. And the sixth quote. In spirituality there is nothing to gain, nothing to lose, but there is only knowing what is. As you have no form, what is the use of any profit? Whatever you have accumulated as knowledge, throw it away. For self-knowledge, remain still and do discriminate correctly between the true and the false, or the real and the unreal. So this is really the essence of spirituality. You're not gaining anything, nor are you losing anything. What is to gain and lose is only for the body and mind, but not for this ultimate reality. If this body and mind has losses, well, we know that's not true. Because our discrimination will say that anything that changes is unreal. If anything changes, it's unreal. So... I don't have to believe in it. I don't have to. It's not real. It's not the reality that I'm seeking. Spirituality shows you what you really are, which is this formless awareness. And as you are this formless awareness, what profit are you going to gain? And what paycheck are you worth? And who cares about your wealth portfolios? Nobody cares. Because in the end, every single body has left empty handed. But the real wealth is remaining in awareness. That's the real wealth. That not only after death you're in awareness, but during your life you're in formless awareness all the time. That's the real wealth. Enjoy the wealth of the world. I'm not saying stop working and give up everything for spirituality. No. Earn your living. Get promoted. Do your best. But... Remember that the real wealth is awareness. That's all. And if we are using knowledge as merely to show how much we know, then we can throw that away. We don't need that. Because it will only become part of the spiritual ego. And as I've mentioned before in my podcast, that the spiritual ego is the worst kind. It's the most difficult thing to transcend. So what would be better is if you have that wisdom of Brahman, use it, be it. Don't just start utilizing it in the sense of, well, I have this wisdom, so I am better. Or I have this wisdom, and my guru gave it, and therefore my guru is true. That's also knowledge, and that's also ego. What you do, what you can do, is be thankful, but mostly just abide in awareness abide in formless awareness don't do anything else that is the ultimate teaching that's the ultimate gratitude so the knowledge of formless awareness is simply this to discern between the real and the unreal and abide by what remains or as Nisargadatta Maharaj said knowing what is so what simply is and if you look into this formless awareness it simply is there is no time in it there's no form in it there's no image in it there's no words in it there's no thoughts in it there's no vasanas in it there's no tendencies in it there's no memories in it there's no karma in it there's no gunas in there like the sattva 
rajas or tamas. There's no wakefulness here, there's no deep sleep, there's no dream. There's no guru, disciple, god or anything like that. There's no freedom, there's no unbound. There's no liberation, there's no ego. There's no five senses. It simply is what it is. But this is what you have to keep discerning. When you're spiritually practicing, when you're doing your nididhyasana, don't think that when you're doing your work at work or when you're revising for an exam or studying at a lecture that you need to do the discernment of the subject you're learning or the the work that you're doing or the email that you're addressing. You don't have to say, well, this is unreal, so I'm not going to do it. That's not being practical and that's not the teachings of spirituality. So we have to get it right. Be this, be in this, and just remain in this. That's all you have to do. And the final quote of the day. Your consciousness is formless. Hence, give up your habit of knowing its future. In the body, God is present in his full form and not in parts. There is no God other than your consciousness. Do your worldly activities as you like it. There is no sin in it. The only sin is to identify with the body. You are the reality and nothing else. And really there's nothing more for me to add to this quote. But to really meditate upon this. Contemplate on it. Do true remembrance of it. But a few things I want to mention. You know there's no parts of God or merging into God. There is only God. And this God that we're talking about is simply formless awareness. There is no need to think of what will happen when I die, as you're not this body. And you are this ultimate formless reality. All you need to do is abide in it. So the message today really is just about abiding in formless awareness. That is our mantra, that is our satsang, that is our remembrance... That is our seva, that's what we serve, that's our love, that's everything. And that's the end of the episode. Please do share this podcast with your friends and family who may enjoy this content. Do follow me on social media to keep getting updates. And you can join the Bearded Mystic Podcast WhatsApp community group to continue the podcast discussion. Details are in the show notes and video description below. If you would like to support the Bearded Mystic podcast, do check out the podcast Patreon page and details are in the show notes and video description below. Please do rate this podcast five stars on your favorite podcast streaming app and do leave a review on that very app or on the Bearded Mystic podcast website. Please do like and comment on this video and subscribe to this YouTube channel and do follow this podcast on your favorite podcast streaming app too. Thank you very much for listening. We'll end with the Soham and Shanti Mantra. Soham, Soham, I am that, I am that. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om peace, peace, peace. Namaste.